Hello and welcome back to Lord of the Collections. I'm your host Tyler Macklem and this is my my host uh, Val Christ, co-host. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and uh, we are joined today by a special guest, the uh, the man behind Castle Con, Reven Con. Uh, we have has graciously agreed to uh, give us a tour of his collection. We're going to have a great episode here. He's got a uh, brand new shiny collectible from Weta and he recently went on the pilgrimage to New Zealand so you're going to want to stay tuned to hear all about that so Reven, how long have you been collecting we'll start you off with an easy one here yeah absolutely so uh, I'm 31 now so I've actually been collecting I guess for 16 years I bought my very first sword uh, when I was 16 or 15 uh, at a flea market um, so I've been collecting the swords for that long. Uh, before that, I would always say that I've always kind of been a collector. I've, I've always loved Lego uh, ever since I was like two. So my Lego collection has been growing for as long as I've remembered. And I have every single Lord of the Rings Lego there is too. Uh, but the, the sword collection and the, the you know, grown up collectibles started uh, when I was 15. So 16 years ago now. Right on. So you've been around for a while in the collecting game. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Yeah. So, I mean, was there something in particular? I mean, I totally get the Lego thing. That's how I started too. And then, oh, I not, I want that set. Oh, I want that set. Keep it keeps growing and getting bigger, and you make more things, and it's fun. Uh, so that's that in itself is a form of collecting. So mm -hmm. you 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 get in at a very early age. So I totally get that, but. Was there anything else beyond that that made you uh, start collecting? Was it a love of uh, Lord of the Rings, love of Star Wars, which I know you're very much into? Um, yeah, absolutely. Why yeah. is it that you collect? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's interesting. I do think that we all have uh, we all have something in our personality, maybe a little bit of the uh, the addict personalities when we're collecting. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's funny because as long as I remember, I've always wanted to collect certain things um so it started with legos and i think that's what you know turned me into an engineer in my education but uh you know even even moving from there it's like i started collecting foreign coins so that was my first probably metal thing so i've always had an affinity for metal and then when i got old enough i like started collecting zippo lighters randomly i don't know why but it was just like i guess i couldn't own a gun when i was a teenager so <laughs> uh you know like you know, or a young teenager was like zippo lighters i don't know why i had like a small collection of 10 zippo lighters never used them never smoked never did anything but just liked metal um and then uh you know uh like many, I was introduced to Lord of the Rings through the Peter Jackson films, um, fell in love with the idea and everything about Tolkien. Um, and I was always been a Star Wars fan, had a couple lightsabers here or there, but um, Star Wars Net was never so much of an, uh, an obsession for me, even though my pseudonym is Revan. Um, you know, it's just been like that for forever. It was my 501st name. But, uh, you know, moving into like Lord of the Rings, that's where I found my true true love and like that's it is my ultimate fandom so um saw the movies and everything and then they, you know love lord of the rings love collecting metal things so you know went to a flea market with my parents and i was just like oh look there's lord of the rings swords for sale <laughs> and i think that's where it all started yeah exactly yeah. very cool right on so do you remember your your first lord of the rings collectible Yep. Ab yeah. Absolutely. So it is, it is the Strider sword oh, right yeah. there. Yeah. So my very first, my very first was, uh, was I saved up. I could tell the difference in quality between the, you know, knockoffs and the, mm. the, the real ones. And um, I'm always looking for a deal. And there was, I remember it back in the days, you know, so 16 years ago, um, I remember, you know, actually getting there and the swords were back then, I think they were, I think their normal sales price, their, their retail, their map was like 180, 190. They didn't quite hit 200 yet. And um, I, this guy was selling it. Um, it was brand new, but the box was just all messed up. 
140, I think is what I bought it for. Um, you know, so back then he probably broke even on it. Um, and so that was my first one. And then, you know, I I loved it. And then I was like, "Mm, I can't keep buying a 15. So I couldn't keep buying $200 swords or $150 swords and 15. So I got a couple knockoffs at at some point, got like some knockoff Legolas daggers and and what. Um, and then as I, you know, got a full-time job really when I, you're not full-time, but when I got a part-time job when I was 16 and then full-time job when I was 18, uh, was able to, you know, expand out and, you know, um, sold off the, a couple of the knockoffs and uh, stuck with the night cutlery stuff full from there. Hmm. Nice. Good addiction. Yeah. <laughs> we can all relate. We can all relate. Yeah. Um, so obviously Lord of the Rings is the big thing that answers basically what you mainly collect, but is there beyond that, is there like a, specific philosophy to your collection are you just like into the weapon props you branch out into the statues uh like there's other things out there i'm not gonna yeah no i, <laughs> I really actually, shouldn't yeah. poo it because i mean they're, they're, there's collecting is such a broad spectrum like i want to i don't want to say like oh if you collect lord of the rings bobbleheads that you're silly no it's I, I want to put it into the perspective that it, it's just not something for me. So I'm not into the the more toy like stuff. Yep. I, I prefer the 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 replicas like the swords, the the f- true representations of what we saw in the movies, and then with the statues that they're you know it's a piece of art represents the character kind of thing. But there's far and beyond out there in terms of what you can collect that isn't just those two things. So how does it? What is it for you? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is one of those interesting ones, right? So this is one as you grow as a correct collector and depending on how young you start. So I started fairly young, right? So I know who you don't, I, I changed my major three times. So my collection changed quite a bit too, right? Um, you know, so when I was younger, I remember being in college and working full time and I was kind of, my, my collection was very shotgun, you know, in my early twenties, it was like, okay, the the United Color Swords were clearly the, the foundation. But I was like, hmm, let me get some sideshow uh, statues. So at some point, like I had, uh, you know, like the the sideshow premium format, uh, Gandalf, Arwen, Aragorn, and and the uh, Baromir in armor, and I really liked those. Um, and then I got into some of the statues, but not all of them. So I had a couple of the original sideshow Weta combo um, statues. Uh, of course, we talked about the Legos. Um, and then I was also kind of getting into some of the toys, right? So I got some of the toy biz stuff. On the on the Star Wars side, I was, you know, buying and reselling Star Wars, uh, you know, figurines as well, and then figuring out what I liked. And then I would say probably, it was probably right, it was like right around the time I graduated when I got my first job and had to move across country. So I moved from Florida up to Indiana for my very first job that I kind of just sat down and I realized, wow, like, I we I always call it the hard stuff. I like the hard stuff. I don't like the soft stuff. And it, it not it's not meant to be uh, as you said like condescending or anything. Like I was just like for me like the toys anything plasticky. I was like okay I need to get rid of this, um, and I need to focus really on you know hard stuff. So to me that was like props and statues. And then when I got to Indiana, I was only there for a year and then moved three more times in four years. And so I think by the third or fourth move I was like. I'm going to break one of these really expensive statues. So I said, you know what? I'm going to sell. I, so I sold all of my statues really, except for like the ones that came with the um, special extended edition DVDs, like the little Minas Tirith and the little yeah, Arnoff. Yeah. And so I pretty much sold everything except for those statues. I, I had no statues left um, and I really just focused on props. So really, I think that's where my, you know, to get to your question long winded is I really focus on props now. It's swords. Um, it is in the in the in the Star Wars world. I do have a small lightsaber collection, so it's just lightsabers or or blasters. Just got some Django Fett blasters from a uh, Marauders junkyard, um, and it's it's mainly that. And then like I do have some of the Weta stuff in terms of props again. So just got Gladrol's file. That's a full size prop. Um, some of the jewelry. Uh, so I got some Jens Hansen Hansen stuff. Um, and then the only other piece I'd say is I do have some like wall art. So, uh, some, some maps and, and Weta images or imageries. Um, and I do have one statue. The, the thing that made me fall in love with Lord of the Rings was the Argonoth. And I always wanted the, the first edition, but I, I refused to pay eBay prices for anything. So I waited, 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 and then they came out with the newest revision. So I've got the Argonaut sitting here and that's right next to my work computer. And so that's it. So philosophy is props with the exception of the, uh, with the exception of some artwork. And then of course, uh, the Argonaut. Awesome. 
So of your collection, do you have uh, a favorite piece? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah. I know that we talked about some nice new shiny things. Um, yes. uh, coming back from, uh, it actually, the, the my nice new shiny piece was just Kismet. Um, I was actually saving up for a Master Swordsmith collection, Eowyn. Uh, they had two left and I emailed Weta and I said, hey Weta, I'm coming to New Zealand in, in December. Can you, I'll pay full, I'll pay it all down. Right, It was like August. It's like, I'll pay for it full, but can I just bring it back with me because I knew that I was flying. I knew that I could actually had um, an extra bag that I could quote check and what I was going to charge like a thousand dollars for shipping, which makes sense. It's a very heavy box, but I was like, I can bring it back for free. I can save a thousand dollars and then pick it up in New Zealand and feel like I, you know, and like, no, we can't hold it for you. It was very sad. So, um, you know, they were like, if, if you get here and it's still here, you can buy it, of course. And unfortunately it was sold out. So I had that money sitting and didn't really spend a lot of other money in New Zealand on, on props or anything. And then literally right when I got back from New Zealand, we, there was, uh, on one of the Facebook groups, it was someone uh, is moving overseas to a country where they can't have any sort of weaponry. Um, and, uh, they were selling their MSSCs and, uh, one of those was Barmir and Barmir is one of my top three favorite swords. And uh, I had the money sitting there and, you know, and we were like, all right, let's do it. I was like, I was the first one to say anything and I was the first one to get it. And I sent him a box to, to send it back to me and you know, a label. And uh, so I got it. So I'll grab it real quick and uh, I'll show you. Oh boy. <laughs> Sorry. So let's see here. So we have our official Peter Lyon, oh, wow. Master Swordsmith collection, uh, Baramir sword here. Let me grab this. There we go. So I'm not touching the blade. So yeah. So this one is uh, this one is uh, been sharpened. Uh, it's also ha it's been uh, you know Middle Earth weathered. I think they called it. So it's got oh, some markings it's hard to see in this light you it's actually got some like markings and not rust spots but like fake rust spots on it oh, yeah. um th throughout um a little bit of weathering in the hilts as well um yeah so and you know I, I i own quite a few swords like actual like medieval replica swords that are not uh lord of the rings that are fully functional high carbon steel and whatnot and uh you just i you know even though i carry those around at a renfair or something i always forget the difference between uh uh, stainless and high carbon. So, you know, if I've got the MSSC here and then I've got our United Cutlery one right here as well. So right next to it. Oh yeah. Uh, um, you know, a couple things, of course, you notice differences just, you know, between the hilts, um, you can tell, you know, there's quite a bit of difference between the, the fineness of the, of the finishing here. This is much thinner on the MSSC, um, cause they're not using that, 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 uh, uh, zinc alloy, um, it's actual, uh, mild steel there, but wraps are clearly, um, hand wraps are clearly much better on the, uh, on the MSC than there oh, as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot, lot more uh, specific. Um, but just the weight, I was, I was, my wife was like, you know, you've never shown me it's, it's this, the sword's been sitting for two weeks or, or three weeks. You haven't even shown me the sword. I, I didn't realize I hadn't shown her. And so I had her pick up, I had her pick, pick it up and she's like, wow, this is surprisingly light. Um, and just because she's used to, you know, carrying around a lot of the United Cutlery ones helping me ship. And, uh, and it, it is crazy how much, how, how much better the balance is, you know, you, you, I can hold it like this and not feel like it's pulling me down. Um, and the balance on this is just amazing. So uh, yeah, this would definitely be my, uh, the, the crowning achievement in the, in the collection. The only thing that would probably top this would be a Strider sword if I can ever get myself on a, my hands on an MSC Strider, but yeah. Well, I, I was going to ask you, what would you pick in a fire? But I think we all know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of, out of everything. It def definitely, you know, when you have one of 15 in the world, um, yeah. I'll, I'll take that. I mean, nothing else in my collection is 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 like that, um, for sure. Uh, everything else can be easily, uh, easily replaced, but this guy, not so much. So, um, yeah. That would be yeah, it's uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take some pictures of this next to. Actually, I'll give it to my dad because he's a professional photographer. But I'm gonna take some pictures of this next to the uh, United one just to show people the differences. Because um, even though I sell United, I want to you know educate people on the differences so they know. Um, but I do have to say, you know, out of all the complaints that sometimes you know United gets hit hit with, even though there are some clear differences, you know, United one's a little bit fatter 
It is, um, but it's actually, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty close. It's pretty close. So yeah. I, in terms of look, of course, and feel, it's totally different. But in terms of look, I'm, I'm, I was actually was like, oh, okay, that is a good job there. You know, for, for the price difference, the United one is pretty good. Yeah. You know, you know yeah. yeah and- absolutely. So, I, you know, I don't know if many people have seen, but often when Peter, he's doing his uh, kind of tours and stuff, he'll often, I've seen him take the Boromir sword and he seems to love doing it with the Boromir sword. And he will, you know, he'll, he'll really flex it and show off that. Have you tried that yet? Are you too scared? No, I, I haven't tried it yet. Um, yeah. I think a, a part of it is, is I actually, so I, I'm going to do, I will do, but uh, right. I think a, a part of it is, let's see here. I'm not going to, I don't think I can go all the way to that. But let's let's grab it here. Let's go because oh, this one is actually sharp, so I can get a little little bend here. Oh yeah, and it bends right back. No cracking, no nothing. Yeah. Um, not gonna go full full on just because it is sharp. I don't have my. I'm, I I, was, I wanted to try it out, but I don't have my. Uh, I have some um, like knife proof gloves that I you I have. I just like, buried in my garage somewhere. So you know, I was actually trying to find them today so I could do that. But I got a little bit with that. <laughs> yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, th- I mean, the blade's awesome and um, the balance is crazy. I, I took it outside. I know I see so many people when they when they carry them, they have their gloves on and I'm, I'm like, I just, I have, I have my oil. I clean it after I touch it. But uh, <laughs> I'm like, I bought this. So I want to feel it. Mm-hmm. So you're going to try to get the uh, scabbard and belt one day? You know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, from Peter, probably not. Because I mean, the person who you know, that they sell them together, right? So um, the chances of me getting a Peter Lion one are, are pretty slim unless I sell this and rebuy another one that has it together. Um, but I, I've, I've talked about, I've talked to a few people um, who've, you know, worked on this Faramir costume and some other things. And we talked about ways that we can uh, maybe create a scabbard. Um, yeah, we want to, the, the way I want to display this, because uh, we do have cats and hair and all and dust. Um, I want to create a shadow box. Uh, so I've got the, I've got the measurements of the original Barmir uh, shield. Oh, yeah. And so I'm, uh, I've started sketching out on cardboard how to make that. Uh, so I want to make a, a Barmir shield one for one, uh, get that, get the scabbard, of course, got the United Cutlery horn. Um, and then, uh, you know, Fingers crossed, UC will come out with the uh, come out with the bar mirror uh, dagger as well, and I'll put that all in a you know three foot by four foot tall shadow box um, in walnut, and then that way it's under glass and away from things, and I don't have to worry about the the Florida humidity as much as uh, as much as I would have to just sitting on my wall. That would be uh, pretty epic looking, I think. Um, I don't know if you've seen, but uh, Jamie Shakespeare he made a really nice scabbard for his I, I saw that it looks really good so uh Revan do you think it would be possible to get a, a tour of your collection here yeah absolutely so I'll walk you around um as I said we've uh, of course have our uh, our MSC so I'll go put that I'll roll over here and put that back in um so the collection is a little sparse uh, in terms of our uh, our presentation today um, just because my, my father's a professional photographer and he's taking a lot of the pictures for our, uh, for the business and doing a lot of the cool images from our Castle Con, um, uh, Instagram. So right now I've got, like, like we said, my very first sword, which would be uh, Strider. We have the scabbard here. This is the, the first edition scabbard. So it doesn't have the, the extra inaccurate belts. <laughs> I know oh, yeah. Val, we talked, Kit was talking about yeah. that, how in the second run, they just, had some extra uh, fabric laying around, so or extra leather, so they just kind of attacked it on, even though it wasn't remotely accurate. But uh, hey, I got the first edition there, um, and then I do have myself the El- uh, LSR crown, of course. Um, not Lord of the Rings, but uh, my wife for Christmas uh, bought me a uh, a new windless sword. This is based off of a, a historical one. Um, it's a 15th century falchion, so nice little Christmas gift from the wife. Uh, over here, uh, this is this is my actual work desk. So as I said, we do have the Argonaut sitting there, uh, drawing from my niece. But we have the Argonaut sitting there, and we get to see the, uh, the Strider uh, knife at all times. Uh, so I'm surrounded by Gondor uh, all day when I work. And then back in this cabinet over here, uh, in the same office, this is where I've got a lot of the, uh, a lot of my extra little Weta stuff or um, uh, some of my lightsabers, I'm trying to get some stands for them. So I've got some lightsabers up there. 
everything. Uh, a lot of these four of them are actually from our wedding. We had them uh, from uh, uh, the Saber folks who, who use the app. I'm, I'm losing the, the name of them, but um, they're awesome because I can change the colors and everything in an app. Um, got uh, uh, some, uh, of course, Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Yoda down there. And of course, from the uh, from the side of things like we talked about, uh, are two uh, statues from the original uh, DVDs. Uh, when we were in uh, New Zealand, we picked up two elven brooches from Weta. Uh, also picked up uh, a new Nenya. My, uh, we had the Noble Collection Nenya here, and then we have the uh, the Weta Nenya as well. Uh, so we wanted to pick up those. Uh, got ourselves uh, the file of Galadriel. We got a little Hobbit Hulk collection here. Uh, and a couple pipes. Uh, and then the bottom or kind of mid bottom shelf here is just a couple more of the statues from the uh, the you know collector's edition of the DVDs or Blu-rays. And then uh, the very last one they actually had at Weta was uh, Thorin's Ring. Uh, and it was actually my size. So I felt like that was a perfect timing. It was the last one they had at the Weta Cave. So I said, you know what, I don't own it. And we got a discount, so why not? So. Uh, that's, you know, the collection is kind of sparse right now, um, <laughs> but uh, being, uh, you know, the, the guy who runs CastleCon, I do actually have one of every United item um, that is in production um, and a, a couple things that are out of production, um, uh, you know, the knife and, and the scabbard as we talked about. Um, actually, in that little box down there, I just got this right before I left for New Zealand. That guy is actually a, a first edition Gimli helm. It's number 100 of the Gimli helms. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so I got, got a Gimli helm as well, which was cool. Uh, did that in a trade for one of the new helms. And uh, yeah, so uh, collection's a little light, but uh, you know, got a couple other cool things from New Zealand. Um, uh, a lot of cool stuff from Daniel Reeves, the maker of, uh, of all the maps and and whatnot. So this is the uh, the contract from the Hobbit. I've uh, got some really cool little um, drawings. So he he created a new version of Smaug for the Hobbit films. So this is a, an original hand drawing from Daniel Reeves there. Um, and of course, since he invented like all the languages or not the languages, but the all the the fonts. So little, oh yeah, you know, yeah. So there's Galadriel, even the smallest person. So we're gonna frame these and get these hung. Would rather spend one lifetime with you. Quote, um, little hand drawing of a uh, tree of Gondor. Um, and then of course, not all who wander are lost. So I uh, really enjoyed that. And the Lothlorien leaf was uh, was our main motif in our wedding. Uh, so the Lorien leaf means a lot to us. It's in our wedding rings and, um, and whatnot. So I'd say that that's a, we got some, a lot of cool stuff from there. And then the other thing was when we went and visit, uh, visited Jens Hansen, um, I did get myself an official uh, Vilia. Nice. So, of nice. course, he calls it the, the Ring of Hugo for uh, copyright for licenses reasons. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is beautiful. Yeah. Was that identical to make the uh, Noble Collection in that pretty much every way? Or no, that's all differences already. Yeah, it, it so, is. It's yeah. not the. I think the Weta one is gold, not the Weta, the Noble one is gold plated, I think. I have it. Yeah. But so one thing I do know and I don't like about the Noble one is that the stone is very dark. It almost looks black. If you shine a light behind it on the Noble Collection one, it, 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 it is blue, but it's very, very dark. That one looks like so much brighter. Uh, yeah. So I think the Jens, kind of Jens the Hansen ones are real stones, right? Correct. Um, so there's a couple ways you can do it. Um, so uh, I told him, I said, hey, look, I want you to make it just like the movie. And to do that, um, it is actually 14 karat gold that has uh, a rhodium um, plating to get that darker color right there. Um, so that's so it is actually fully gold, but then you can see that when you look on the inside. Uh, but then it has that rhodium plating on the outside. And so as this gets worn, this will kind of crack a little bit, look a little bit more like it. And then the stones, you can do a lot of different things with the stones. Um, so I, I asked, you know, what was the original? And it was, I think it's called a Ceylon with a C. Ceylon uh, Sapphire is what was used actually in the movie. Um, and it's kind of slightly purple hue. 
Um, and again, me being the kind of ethical, I'm worried about ethics and stuff when I buy products. So instead of getting a, an official Ceylon, um, that would have to be mined naturally. I asked for a lab created sapphire. So it's still a real sapphire, but it's just lab created. So I know that I don't have to worry about any blood diamonds or um, slave labor or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I told him, hey, you know, you've got the original picture that it's got that slight purple tint. Um, so if you can find a lab created um, sapphire that's close to that. And yeah, so they did. I gave them two months to do it. And I, we actually, it's funny when we visited Yen's, um, we, uh, I tried it on and realized that it was actually too big. Uh, so they resized it for me and then uh, mailed it to me after after we left. That's great yeah. service. Yeah, yeah. The, the folks at Yen's, I mean, Halfdan is the uh, is the son that's remaining. Um, he's such a cool dude, great mustache. Um, and then the whole the whole staff at Yen's is uh, they're they are absolutely fantastic. I I'd say that out of all the vendors I worked with or that we kind of visited or or hung out with uh I, I really enjoyed them but i've also got a thing with jewelers because i designed jewelry for my wife and i and um so they're always i appreciate their art and <laughs> i think they can feel that so they give us good service back so right. on the on the topic of rings here quick um you mentioned you had uh nenya from noble collection and weta would it be mm -hmm. possible for us to see yeah. just to see the differences yeah you know, for yeah, any, of, any of uh, anybody watching here might be looking at, you know, wondering which one to get and wondering what they might prefer. Yeah, absolutely. So let me, uh, let me get them for you. So, um, look, I love the folks at Weta. I'm not going to say anything bad about Weta in general. I will say it's kind of weird, though. I do think that Noble does uh, jewelry better than Weta does. So, um, so this... Let's see if I can get it to actually go in, maybe. Maybe right there. So this is the noble. It's you, there's a lot of really fine details on it, as you can see, especially yeah. right there underneath the crown. And so let me do that. Okay, there. And then if I add in the now, granted, remember this Nenya is like five years old and it's been worn, so it's a little more tarnished, of course. And the Weta version is, it's just not as fine. Um, it's got, it's just a little chunkier. Um, it's just, it, you know, it, it, it definitely radiates more, not just because it's silver, but just because there's more silver of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it is definitely chunkier. And so, you know, especially when you look at the sides there, um, it's one of those things where you just kind of like, you know, but there's also some slight differences, right? Uh, the, 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 uh, the noble collection version is based off of the lord of the rings and then the uh the weta version is based off the hobbit so maybe mm -hmm. for all i know maybe it is more accurate to the hobbit because this one was maybe too 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 spiky for kate 20 years ago so when they brought her back 10 years later they said she said give me something less spiky i don't know <laughs> um but my my wife prefers the noble one if she if she does her galadriel costume she wears the noble one mm. but, yeah well, but, I like I know in the in the Hobbit they had to remake Gandalf's costume essentially because they said it was part of film history. You know, it was a it was too valuable to risk in the filming of the Hobbit. And who knows? Maybe they uh, did the same thing with Nenya. Yeah, I mean, the one thing we learned um, from Yens is that uh, is that uh, so Yens actually made well, yeah, the actual original Yens. Um, before he passed 20 years ago, um, he actually made the Wandering Vilya, Nenya, and Narnia. Um, and so the versions that you can buy on Yen's are actually the original versions that were sent to Peter Jackson and Weta for approval. And they only chose, of course, the One Ring and Vilya, and they went elsewhere for the other two. Mm -hmm. um, and the other two were actually, at least according to Halfdan, when he told the story to us, he said um, that, that Weta actually just kind of did it internally um they didn't actually go to another jeweler so they were more like costume jewelry not real jewelry um meaning like they weren't made by hand by an actual jeweler so they felt more um i guess they were a lot more um brittle or, or fragile so they were going through a lot of those other rings quicker because they were they were just kind of like not 3d printed at the time but quickly made at the time mm -hmm. um and so yeah and the same thing with the the ring for vigo um for the the ring of barrier um, their version is actually quite 
quite close to the movie version, but not quite, uh, not quite exactly accurate. Um, so they, they decided to take that design and go a little bit in a different way. Um, I think that's why when you see the, you know, some of those pictures of, you know, Vigo's ring of uh, the ring of bear here, you, you sometimes like see it in some shots. You're like, that doesn't look very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then we'll say it's a it's a it's a five thousand year old ring, so it's been through a lot, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, so you know, who knows? I mean, like, I'm sure that they had to remake some things, of course, from the, for the Hobbit, and maybe this one is closer uh, to that. But uh, you know, my wife prefers the the noble version. Fair enough. Well, thank you for that. I, yeah, I was not I, mean, ex- I was not expecting ring lore when uh when we. When we were going to do this interview, so that was a well, cool, uh, cool treat. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. All right, so uh, we've talked and talked about and seen a lot of the stuff that you have. Uh, let's talk about what you don't have. What's mm. the one thing that got away? What do you regret not getting that maybe is just not possible now, or you kind of have it on the back burner? He says, "I'll get that one day," kind of thing. What What's your yeah. regret? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, it's one of those things, right? I mean, so I will say the Master Sources collection pieces in general have, have been like that for me. I remember I remember when I, first, when I got my first real job out of college, right? I was, you know, went from making no money to actually having a salary. And even then, I, you know, I was like, you know, the Night Cutler stuff is good enough for me. You know, I've got my real swords. I want them. I would never pay $5,000 for a salary. And then, you know, it's like, I, you know, back then I could have paid $5,000. It's a lot of money. Yeah, but I could have paid $5,000 for, uh, like a- uh, for, for a Strider, right? And yeah. and I know that the guy who sold me his Baromir sold his Strider for $30,000. So, um, you know, when, when I think about the things that got away, you know, I was like, of course I was, you know, I wasn't, you know, as successful as I was now and couldn't afford it back then, the $5,000. I, I probably could have if I would have readjusted my priorities but um yeah i mean thinking about the strider sword the mssc strider is definitely the one that got away from me because i i mean that is my top three favorite swords are strider baromir and farmir so i've got one of the three and one of them doesn't exist um and one of them i'm i now have to figure out a way to you know befriend someone who's really old and dies one day or come up with probably fifty thousand dollars the next time and that's just crazy um but uh yeah i think that would be the main thing if i think about you know, it's funny, the, um, the Argonoth, you know, the original Argonoth was definitely, that was the one that got away from me forever until they re-released the new Argonoth, which is bigger and better. So um, I'm happy with that. Um, so I would have said that if it wasn't for the, uh, for the Argonoth coming back. Um, so that was the only statue I really, really wanted. Um, Sword-wise, you know, it's not so much. I think I've, I've been around long enough with all the Lord of the Rings swords. Um, you know, there's, there's things that I didn't get, right? I, I never... I never got the original Isildur, but I wasn't really upset about it. I don't, it's a very nice sword, but I didn't love it. Um, so when it sold out and then I saw people buying them for $2,000 or $3,000 online, it's, that's crazy. It's, it's a United Cutler sword. And hey, they're coming back this year, hopefully, um, if not next year. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that the two things uh, would have been the, the Strider sword and then uh, it would have been the, the, the Argonoth, but not so much the Argonoth anymore. Very cool. So, uh you're obviously Gondor is the main thing and it's a theme in your collection and that's your favorite and that's but you've not once mentioned the main sword of that entire culture Do, are you uh, not a fan I mean, of Anduril? I mean is it it's a it's a sword made by dwarves that was reforged by elves <laughs> it's um, tainted is that what you're saying yeah, no, no. <laughs> so, yeah so here's the thing uh I you know I told you that I was into actual medieval swords as well, like, you know, historical replicas. My absolute favorite style of sword is called an Oak Shot 14, and it's actually very similar to a Baromir sword. It's a short, one-handed sword. It actually is a slightly smaller uh, grip uh, than Baromir. It's an it's a arming sword, uh, typically would be used by archers, um, wide blade, nice point, um, and it'd be used uh, sword and shield. That's my, I, I love one-handed swords. Out of all the swords I like, one-handed swords i will always gravitate towards if you put me on the website for uh for any sword maker like albion i you know if i put things in my cart it's it, i mean I, I feel like my whole collection would be those type of swords and so i have to branch out strider is just on the edge strider is just on the edge of being too long for me <laughs> um but i green's my favorite color so it fits in there 
Um, Anduril, I like Anduril, I have no problem. I'm very excited to have Anduril back in my collection. I sold my limited edition um, uh, UC, uh, actually even before I knew that the museum collection was coming back out. I saw it, I was sitting at it, I looked at it and said, hey, look, I could probably sell this for around $1,000. I bought it for like, I don't know, 200 or something back in the day. Um, I can sell it and I'll just get, you know, I'll get a, a regular edition one. I, it, it's not my favorite sword, so I can do it. And then the MC was, it was, uh, you know, announced a couple months later. So, um, I like the sword. I don't love it. I know it is the most popular sword. I mean, out of all the swords I sell, the top two are Anduril and then Glendron. Those are the top two. Um, and you know, they're great swords. I like them, but I just, I, I just don't really like long swords. That's my thing. I think, uh, I've only got, you know, in my collection of like historical swords, I have one long sword, one two-handed sword. Everything else are, 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 are short one in it or, or bastard hand in that sense. Fair enough. So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely yeah. a style and a preference. I, yeah, I would think Anduril is almost like a, uh, what do they call them, bastard sword, like the hand and a half? Yeah, I would, I would say that, yeah, I'd say that um, Strider is a bastard sword. It's just it's just on that cusp um, where Anduril is actually a two-handed sword. Uh, you know, typically, your grip would be a lot longer, but it was a style choice by Peter Lyon and or um, whoever designed the sword. I don't, I don't know. Is that a John Howe? It was John Howe, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it was John Howe. Yeah, he had, they had the one grip, but then at the, at the extended long pommel. Um, historically, that would that really would have just been an extra long two handed grip, and then the, the pommel would be much shorter. But um, it's a beautiful design. I love it. I'll be excited to have it back on the wall. I'll put it back up um, somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, my 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 collection has always been if I have to if I have a small amount of room, like if I'm moving into an apartment short time for for work or whatever. Uh, my collection was always Barmir, Strider, and Anduril, and it was always those those three up. Um, do you like Anduril? It's up there. It's probably in the top five or ten um but she's not the top three <laughs> that's that's fair you know it's yeah. funny you, you talk to some people and their their favorite sword of all time is it's glamdring or strider's sword or boromir's sword or enduriel you know um we're about similar age and when i I remember seeing enduriel and oh man i just thought it was the coolest fucking sword ever created <laughs> you know like it's you know that painting all of that where God's touching out, just about to touch Adam. I feel like yeah. that was what happened when John Howe was designing Anduriel, you know, like, like the Lord was the guiding his pencil, you know, like, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, that's it's crazy to hear about how, how much those bastard swords from the collection swords originally went for, you know, $5,000 yeah, I mean, to 30000 yeah. It's like, forget, yeah. forget Rolexes, invest in Weta Steel. <laughs> yeah i mean absolutely right yeah. i mean so even i mean even the bar mirror, right i mean granted um i mean the 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 individual i bought the bar mirror from was very fair he barely marked it up so i think back in that point it was six thousand for the bar mirror plus it was a thousand for the weathering 500 ish for the sharpening that's a lot of money for sharpening by the way so 50 to 100 dollars for sharpening guys but anyways 500 for sharpening and then um i think it was a thousand for shipping so i think all in all he was in at 65 75 8500 ish and i bought it for i bought it for ten thousand, which it's a lot of money and like again i saved up for a very long time <laughs> for this uh for the air um and uh so i had it there and um, so, I mean, but it was really, it was great that, I mean, that, he didn't really upcharge on that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, the original ones, so the the, the Andorals, I haven't seen any of those go on sale. So I, if those went on auction, they'd probably go for 50000 easily. Same thing with the Glam Dring. Um, and then, yeah. But I mean, the Glam Dring, you know, uh, Sideshow sold their prototype version, which was, I think, aluminum bladed. Yeah. It was, it never even saw screen time. Uh, you know, Ian McKellen, Serena didn't even hold that thing. And that auctioned for $250,000 for an aluminum blade. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, it had like yeah. uh, the rubber, mm -hmm. rubber, you know, uh, hilt mm -hmm. and everything. I remember Adam Savage did a, a video. Yeah, on he did the video on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, which was cool. Yeah. So, yeah, as much yeah. as it'd be cool to have, hold something that the actors held. I, you know, yeah, maybe, you know, it's funny. 10 years ago, I said never spend five thousand dollars a sword, I just spent 10. So now I'm like, I would never spend 250,000. Maybe, maybe when the wife's a doctor and like I'm a, a CEO of some <laughs> company, maybe I'll, 
I don't know. I mean, but right now in my life, I just can't imagine spending my, uh, my the house, the value of my house on a sled. <laughs> never say never. We yeah, all we all cross those thresholds when we uh, collect. Yeah, there's always something. So you've been uh, collecting for a while, you know, and you've seen quite a bit. You know, your collections evolved here and there. What advice would you give to a new collector coming into this this hobby? Ooh, and uh, yeah. So I would say that the one thing that you know, and I mentioned, I t- touched on this a little bit. How like I grew, of course, I matured, went from a, a, a teenager tween into a functioning adult <laughs> with a career. Um, but one of the things I definitely say is. Um, one of the things that's helped me is I actually create a running list and maybe this is a consultant side of me as well, or an engineer of me, but I actually have a running list of all the things that I want in any given year. Um, so all the Weta stuff or swords or Legos or, um, even small things, um, you know, CDs or books or whatever. I have a running list and that's just in a spreadsheet online. Um, and it's a couple of things. First of all, I prioritize it, um, by what I want. And so I kind of realized when I, when I'm like, I would rather have this than this. And I sit down and I say to myself, okay, well, if this item's $2,000 for whatever it is, um, you know, something new for the house or whatever. Um, but then I've got a bunch of small things. Uh, and then I really have to just, I, it allows me to weigh what is more valuable to me. And so I say this because I started doing this in the last few years. And I, if I had done this when I was in my early 20s, when I first got my, like, my real career, I would have done that and realized that I shouldn't have bought all these two or three hundred or four hundred dollar sideshow statues that I liked but didn't love. I should have just saved that money and bought the five thousand dollars Stratosart because that's what I really love. Mm. Um, so the prioritization thing has really helped me. And like I, you know, as smart as I think I might be, like doing it in my head didn't work because then I would just kind of, uh, you know, quickly buy something because you know it's like oh. Sideshow Weta has a new Aragorn statue. I like Aragorn. I can't get the Strider sword, so I can get this. Um, you do that 10 times, and then you could bought it, right? Um, and I will say that also helps is if you put all your cheap stuff on there, too, like CDs, books, you want a, you want a new revision of Silmarillion, you know, illustrated by someone else, like the original by Tolkien, right? Um, if you put that on, and then, you know, your parents or, or friends, family ask you, hey, what do you want for your birthday? What do you want for your, uh, what do you want for Christmas? You can literally just send them the list and just reorganize it by cheapest to uh, most expensive and say, hey, anything on here you want. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then you, you always have a, li- a gift list for people too. So, I mean, honestly, that's what we do is like my wife and I, we both kind of prioritize what we want. We keep that on a running list for each other. Um, and then Christmas time, um, holiday time, we send it to our friends and family and say, hey, anything on here, you know, you know, for 20 bucks or whatever, if you want to buy it for us, that'd be great. We'd appreciate it. Um, and then that makes gift buying for other people really easy, too. Yeah. That, so, you know, setting collection goals and uh, prioritizing those goals. I think that's no, that's good advice. And it's just good life advice, too. You know, um, as yeah. Uh, yeah. Getting into collecting, you know, so much of my collection is not necessarily stuff I ever thought I'd own, but they were good deals, <laughs> whether locally or eBay. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, that that bust of that character, I don't know if I really, I didn't plan on getting it, but it's a really good deal. And so, you know, I don't regret it whenever I get it because it looks good in my collection, but, you know, it's like, well... Had I not done that, I maybe could have had uh, Minas Morgul or I could have had, you know, some of that other stuff instead of, uh, you know, some of these other smaller pieces, which they do add up, you know, once you get shipping and all that stuff, it, uh, the price goes up pretty quick on a lot of those small quarter scale busts and other little yeah. things. So, oh, yeah, that's, I, that's I, love, good advice. I absolutely love them. I mean, I love all the little busts. I love the statues. I mean, you know, I, I, I'll tell you that that sideshow premium format uh, bar mirror and the armor with the with the flag. I mean, that was. I mean, out of all the statues, I, I mean, that's it's so magnificent. I love it. And like, I was a little sad when I sold it because it was like it was something I did love. But then, like, again, it was one of those things where I think it was because I moved so much, as you know, things sat in boxes for longer than they should have, and um maybe this is just kind of like the buddhist kind of philosophy of not wanting as much or whatever is i think for me at least in my life now it's very much quant or quality over quantity um and so like i'm kind of like paring things down where i said okay like you know even the hobbit holes i got like a shelf of those and like you know they're cheap they're really cool but now that i've been to hobbiton do i need all of them? 
<laughs> so I think, you know, is that, and then the other thing was when, I, when things sat in the closet for a year, it was kind of that, you know, uh, those, those organizer, home organizer people who are like, you know, if it sits in a drawer or closet for a year, you probably don't need it and should get rid of it. Um, you know, and so I started seeing that same thing with some of my Star Wars statues, like, you know, like had some Star Wars maquettes from animated series and whatnot. And, um, and yeah, so just kind of started to sell those off so that I could say, okay, cool. I have less in my collection. I've got more disposable income to focus on the things I really want. And by, you know, selling off all those and not buying so much more and just kind of putting money away, that's how I could do the MSSC. Because I, I can't buy one of those every month. That is certainly not my <laughs> That's fair. All right. Pretty cool. So aside from being just you know, a big fan and a collector yourself, you, uh, most people probably online and who are watching this know you as Castle Khan. So, mm -hmm. but for those of them, those of those, for those who are listening, who maybe aren't familiar with Castle Khan, uh, what is Castle Khan? And could you just tell us a bit about the company? Yeah, absolutely. So it started 10 years ago. Um, so right as I was leaving college, I, I had a few friends who were from overseas, particularly they were in Australia. And at that point, um, because of the United Cutlery bankruptcy, it was practically impossible to get United Cutlery swords anywhere except in the U.S. Um, and so it, the, the business originally started with just a couple friends of mine saying, hey, I'm going to buy something off eBay, ship it to your house, can you package it together and then ship it to me? I said, yeah, no worries. I, I, I had, I've had friends and family overseas before. I know how to do the customs forms, whatnot, and I can do it. I was like, just pay me for the shipping plus 20 bucks. Uh, that'll be my, you know, my fee. Um, and they were like, yeah, no worries. And so that's how it started. And then I did that for a couple of years, or probably a year, and then, or two, 10 years ago, was, yeah, 2023. Yeah, so, yeah, so probably about a year I did that. And then I said to myself, you know, why don't I just like actually become an authorized retailer of the United Cutler Swords and get people better deals than what's on eBay? Uh, so I looked into it and created my own business. Uh, you know, surprisingly, uh, setting up something like this isn't a, a significant amount of work, but um, put a lot of effort into it to kind of set up the business. And uh, it really, you know, as Val Chris could say, uh, the first few years, I mean, up until honestly, the first five, six years of it was just people saying, hey, you know, United Colors coming out with a new sword, I will PayPal you money and I'll ship it. And then it was, I literally ran the business off of a spreadsheet and email or Facebook. Um, and then, you know, as it grew to more than just, you know, the uh, UC forums folks like Val Chris that grew <laughs> outside of that, um, we said, okay, well, you know, I think we're, we're, we're making just enough profit uh, where we can invest in a, in a in an actual website. So paying for the website fees and whatnot. Before that point, it was like I was already breaking even. Um, I, I started the business to help people get these items in places they couldn't. And so when I got my license, it wasn't about making a profit. I have a full-time job. I'm a cybersecurity consultant. I'm an engineer. I make enough money doing what I'm doing. I'll tell you, Castle Con did not buy the Baromir sword. Um, and so over the years, what I've done is every bit of profit, um, and I'm, I'm very uh, open with it. You know, um, I only make 20 to $30 per item, typically after PayPal fees, and foreign transaction fees, shipping, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the, the, the profit that I've done is I've reinvested that back into the business. So when I first started, it was like, Hey, Val Chris, you, you want uh, the new Baromir horn? Great. You know, I'll get the pre-orders. I'll order it from United Cutlery and I'll slap a label on it, ship it to you for cheaper than anyone else will. Um, but I never held any stock because I, I, I couldn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to put any of my own personal money like into holding stock. And so what I've done is over the years, I've gotten to the point now where I've made enough profit over the years to reinvest that now I've actually got two of every in-production United Cutler item in my house right now, ready to ship. Um, and I, I create an order with United Cutlery usually once every one to two weeks to refill that based off of, um, you know, people buy, you know, a few items, three to five items a week. Uh, I'll place a new order and get those five items back in stock. Um, and then that's allowed me to get the website, grow my stock. And then uh, last year, late last year, I got my Weta license. So I uh, started selling some of the Weta stuff as well, uh, smaller things, um, and then going into some of the larger statues as well now. So, uh, you know, CastleCon really, you know, in short is just, you know, if you want United Cutlery or some of the Weta stuff that's not limited, 
Um, we're here to just give you the cheapest price possible, shipped everywhere. We've shipped, you know, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the Netherlands, UK, Ireland, uh, Norway, my clients from Norway, a um, couple from Germany, Italy, um, one in Macedonia. He has an import license to go into Macedonia. So anywhere where it's legal, I'll ship uh, to you guys. And the goal is to do it for as least amount of money as possible. Because again, I'm not here to make the money. I just want to, I want to help you all because I'm a collector. I'm a lover. I, I met my wife on Lord of the Rings online. We, we love Lord of the Rings. It's our religion. So uh, <laughs> we just want to help other collectors get this stuff as, as cheaply and as quickly as possible. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, I can attest to so much of that, having been there from the start, obviously with you and uh, on UC forums and how, <clears throat> yeah, that was that period there when UC went under and it became, I mean, I'm only, I'm, I'm just a hop and a skip away from you at, up in Canada, but uh, I was going through, uh, th there was a lady in Georgia, she ran a place called a Mithril Armory which was uh, just the same thing as yours, basically taking orders over email and just, you know, not really keeping stock, but just waiting for the box from United to show up at her house, slap a label on it and just turn it right around. Um, but it's just, I think a lot of folks outside of the US just don't understand how difficult it is to import a lot of these things and how to get it reliably. like. You don't just walk into a store here and and see United stuff on the wall. I mean that that is actually how I began to collect. I think I uh, mentioned that in the first episode. I walked into a, a like a key mart of all places at the mall, but you know they had a lot of like cutlery items in there, like you know replica swords and and stuff like that. And there was Sting, and that's how it all started. But beyond that, there there wasn't really a, a good vehicle for obtaining these things and uh so this lady was helping us out for a while and then she uh stopped doing that and then uh once united its second incarnation and got picked up by bud k um they very quickly eliminated their international sales yeah uh, i guess rumor has it that they, they got a lot of complaints from I, I, I don't think a lot of folks that order internationally understand that you do have to pay customs fees and taxes that are applicable to countries and people yeah. don't understand that's not the fault of the shipper that that is your government so i think bud k just probably got fed up with the complaints and they just decided to eliminate that but i mean they basically shut out the rest of the world and yeah. only the U.S. can purchase directly from them. And they give out some really good deals. So uh, I just want to say personally uh, uh, to thank you for, you know, for starting CastleCon and making it just so much simpler and inexpensive for us outside of the U.S. to be able to get these items because it's uh, it, it's been a lifesaver and a money saver in many regards. So, uh, so thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think one of the, the, the other issues um, that a lot of people have uh, when international shipping is, is if something gets broken or lost, the international mm -hmm. claims process is so long. I mean, so I do, I did like the, you know, I, I never really have any, I've actually in, in 10 years, I've only had one metal item be broken. And that was actually a, a manufacturing issue. It wasn't even a shipping issue. Uh, but when we were shipping up the stabs, the new Gandalf stabs, and we had like 40 of those and almost all of them went overseas. We had two of those break, um, one to Australia, one to Europe. And, uh, and the process for that, I mean, I just had to ship the new ones and hope that I got my money back uh, from the from the shipping because it takes like, if, when you're within country, I can get uh, I can get insurance to be claimed within a week, usually uh, international six to eight weeks before I see money back. And sometimes it's only half or 75%. So I, you know, I, I can understand why. Um, but again, like for me, I think the thing is that, you know, we've, uh, we've been doing it long enough and we've got just enough in reserves where uh, it's okay. And um, again, you know, it's not about the profit for us. So I'm, I'm happy that we're, we're here to, to provide it. Uh, it's growing. It used to be just me. Uh, now my, my wife helps. She actually uh, does deals with a lot of the wetest stuff. 
Um, my father's uh, doing all the pictures and, and will ship things for me if I'm out of town. And then I've got uh, one or two friends uh, local as well who are, are big fans who uh, anytime I big pre-orders will come over and, uh, you know, help out for a whole day to try to get as many of these things out on a, on a Saturday uh, to get them all out to, to folks as quickly as possible so I'm not sitting on them for two weeks. Nice. Yeah, and I just want to extend a, a thank you from my end here. You know, as Canadians, you know, you provide a, a very valuable service to the collecting community, uh, not just in Canada, but internationally for those who collect United Cutlery. And and uh, without that service, you know, we would be paying a lot more on eBay and, you know, it'd be a lot more hassle. And, you know, I, I bought my Boromir horn from you and not only, guys, not only does Revan do this, but he also will actually inspect the item before he ships it to you so that, he, you know, you're not getting a, something broken direct from United Cutlery. So, yeah. I'm sure you want, yeah, he I, wants everyone to know that. <laughs> yeah, thanks, it's out thanks, there now. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> Extra I mean, work, so, but. No, I mean, that's the thing is, it, you know, I, I, I inspect, if it is, if it is resin, I typically will inspect it. I, I will say, I've never had an issue with the bar mirror one. So there's yeah. that. Um, if it's resin, though, I'll typically inspect it. Uh, usually, like the um, uh, Sauron maces or whatever. Um, helms I used to not inspect, um, but now I inspect all uh, Thaden helms and all Elendil helms or yeah. Elendil. You know, we can talk about pronunciation of that. I'm going to go with Elendil because you know my my friend who's really deep into Cinderin says it's, uh, put the put that syllable there. But so uh, with the Thaden helms, um, they're the most expensive United Cutler item in history, right? Five hundred sixty dollars, I think, is the base is our is map four to five fifty six or something. Um, and so uh, people have really high expectations, and there's a lot of intricate paint. Um, and we were getting some complaints about the paint. Uh, and so we actually inspect all of those to make sure that the paint is within an acceptable level um, of, of, uh, of kind of uh, uh -huh. sloppiness or cleanliness. Um, and then the Elendil Helms, so guys, the Elendil Helms, this has, been, this has been the bane of my existence for the last two months. Um, the, the Isildur Helms, perfect. The Gondor Helms, perfect. The Elendil Helms, that nose guard, so there's a there's a band there's a, a band that goes around this way that holds the, the the feathers on either side and holds the nose guard, and on, I kid you not, probably thirty to forty percent of them, that band is shifted about a centimeter centimeter and a half in one direction. So if I it, it looks uneven, and so like if you take a ruler over to one um, side, you can see that they'll be like you know. Uh, a couple centimeters off in either direction. Uh, so much so that like on one end, I could fit three fingers, but on the other end, I could fit four. Um, mm. And so that's my first test. I literally just go in with three fingers or four fingers to see if, it, if there's a huge gap. And then if, if there is, then I will take a picture of it, send it back to Ned and say, hey guys, got another one. <laughs> um, so I actually had a customer. To hear that. Yeah, right. So I had a customer. Um, I, you know, I thought it was just a one-off. So I shipped him one. I hadn't, this is before I started inspecting them. He's like, hey, this is off. I was like, oh, so I'm sorry, man. I'll ship you another one real quick. Just shipped him another one. Thought it was a one-off. And he thought and the second one was exactly oh, like that. Uh, and, uh, oh, and this poor guy, he like I literally, it was just this, this batch that I got. Um, because I didn't get uh, many other complaints from other people. But this this is the batch, this one individual veteran here in the United States. Um, luckily it was he luckily he was US, not international. Um, but uh yeah, it was like I literally got, I think, five more. And it was like I got them one at a time from United because I kept buying and shipping one at a time back rather than doing multiples and like i think it was like i think we went through three or four of them after the two <laughs> before we finally got one where i was like finally we got one that's perfect and then the batch after that all of them were perfect so you know it's just one of those things um yeah. you know yeah those were made by windless uh through the united cutlery um uh, mm -hmm. you know subset brand so you know handmade items things happen um but yeah. you know that's what that's what i'm here for make sure that everyone's happy and uh you know of course the customer didn't have to pay for return shipping or anything um and we got him we got him the perfect one send the picture and it was all good i have a last line of defense because uh, quality control is always uh, tricky with a lot of these companies and sometimes you gotta wonder like how did this even make it into the box but sometimes it's just people are just not being paid to do these things or not they're being inattentive so uh, we really appreciate you doing this i think it took i think you had to inspect four or five sauron maces before you got me the one that i 
that you thought yeah. that I was going to be happy with and you and you actually sent me photos of the other ones and asked me like whether I thought that that was acceptable so that 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 was amazing same with that Merkwood uh no, the the polar. Polar. Oh. that, got, I, that I came refused, I, I always joke that they came that was they shipped that from United in like the, the equivalent of a wet paper bag with mm -hmm. zip ties and it just shifted around so much that all of those blades were just marked up and uh, you yeah. went the distance of getting me one that barely had anything on it so again thank you yeah absolutely i think that's the other thing is because i'm a collector too right i mean this, this is this is what i do this is what i love i do this to, to help you all too it's like you know if i wouldn't want it in my collection then i'm not going to put it out so um i can still get that Merkwood polearm from united but i do not have it on the website because i i do not think it is of high enough quality to ship it to people. If someone contacts me and is like, Christian, you know, no matter what, I don't care. I'm going to take this thing. I'm going to be like, you do realize that no matter how we ship this, there's a very high probability this thing snapping into, breaking this way. I'm like, no, I don't care. I'm like, all right, just I'm, I'm going to put it in the terms and conditions that you don't care. <laughs> um, I'll do it, but I don't have it on the website because of that. And it was that one and the Orcris Scabbard. Those were the two that I refused to sell because after I got oh, yeah, my first yeah. pre-order, it was like literally 90 to 95% of them had an issue. And, you know, I was like, I gave people their money back or finally got one that worked. Um, and I originally was not going to sell that Sauron Mace either, but that first round of Sauron Maces year round, unfortunately, Val, those are the ones that had, there's something wrong with the shipping um, containers of it. They didn't have like enough, um, structure in it. And, but ever since that batch, I've never had a sour on mace break. Never. So um that's been, you know, fingers crossed. You know, I've got three sitting here about to go out. So maybe one of those breaks. <laughs> but, um but yeah, so ever since then, um but yeah, so that's the other thing is I try not to sell things that I wouldn't personally have in my collection either. Um and uh so everything on the site is something that I, I would have I feel good about um, you know, within within some level of acceptance of course. Fair enough. Thank you. Hello, friends. We hope you enjoyed part one of our interview with Revan. As a special gift for Lord of the Collection viewers, Revan has graciously donated a $10 coupon for your next purchase at CastleCon. Just use the promo code LOTC at checkout. We'll provide more info uh, in the description. We hope you enjoy part two of our interview with Revan, where we discuss Revan's trip to New Zealand. You're not going to want to miss it. There's some pretty cool stuff. So stay tuned and we will see you around.